The Tower of London is one of those amazing places. If you're coming to London and you've never been before, you've just got to go and visit. But how can you do the whole Tower of London in a day? Well, you can't. So let us help you by showing you some of the key things you'd want to go and see when you're at the Tower of London. In this video, we've got you covered because we're going to start by looking at the southern towers and also palaces along the perimeter. So stick with us as we give you a guided tour to the southern part of the Tower of London. In our first part of the tour, we do the medieval palace, which is this building on the right. Yes, the sort of Tudor building here. It goes across this bridge here and into the Wakefield Tower and comes out on the battlement on the other side of that. So we're going to go right round. When you first come to the Tower of London, seen from the outside, the tower appears to be an austere and forbidding fortress. And surprisingly, it was also a royal palace, once used by the kings and queens who enjoyed astonishing standards of comfort and luxury equivalent to their other palaces. In this part of the palace, we're going to go through the towers built by Edward I, Edward the Confessor, and his father, Henry III, way back in the 1200s. And it was Edward Confessor, uh, Edward I, who was the first king to be buried at Westminster Abbey, which is another video that we've done on previously. So here would have been the area where the king would have entertained. And that big mark you see there on the wall would have been the royal fireplace, where the big roaring fires would have kept this massive room warm. Here we're going into a small octagonal room and in here it was thought it was once a royal chapel. Now we're going to see one which has been done up as a royal chapel a little bit later in this part of the tour. But when you go in here also it gave you great views across the Thames. And of course one of the main entrances into the Tower of London was through the gates almost underneath this tower into the Tower of London complex. It was Edward I that had this tower first built as the main water gate into the castle. And that was between 1275 and 1281, and then had the top floor made into the royal lodgings. Now the king used this room as a hall where he would meet courtiers and important subjects. So you could see why a big roaring fire was needed to make the room as warm and comfortable as possible, to be as impressive as possible to the visitors. The original walls, which showing here as being quite rough, would originally have been plastered and painted, and the windows would have been filled with stained glass to make it really impressive. It's incredible just to stand here, look round, and take in all of the surroundings and think, wow, back in the 1200s, this would have been full of people coming and going. The king would have been here with his subjects and everyone coming to see him. And this place would have been full of life with the major decisions of the day being taken in this very room. Now, the great thing about being up here in this part of the tower is that a lot of it is unrestored. So you're looking at it exactly how it would have been in Edward I and also King Henry III's time. If you can imagine, there were lots of people coming and going in the main hall area that we've just been through. So this area was sort of set aside for King Edward I as a sort of a private area. This would have given amazing views out over the Thames, which would have come straight up to the castle walls. But also you had an area in the corner here, which is believed that's where the lavatory was. So, so far we've looked at the living area of the palace of the Tower of London for King Edward I. Next area we go into are his bed chambers. So this is Edward I's bedchamber, and it might seem a little bright for modern eyes. Its furnishings have been reconstructed based on evidence from inventories and accounts, uh, illuminated manuscripts, and also medieval artworks and antiquarian drawings. The room itself shows the king's bed, which is close to the fireplace for the warmth, but also gives me a great view over the chapel over the water, mentioned in the 13th century records. The paintings on the walls have also been recreated and are based on floral pointing described in accounts for Edward I's mother's chamber at the tower. 
I just love the shields going round this really large ornate fireplace here. And here in the corner of the room you have another one of these octagonal turrets but as you can see here it was all set up as a private chapel for the king's own personal use in the corner. And just look at the amazing tiling on the floor which really really adds to it which is incredible. Now you think for a bedchamber that this room is quite big but also quite bright but on occasion Edward I may have conducted private business in the bedchamber and also eaten on the small table that you see here attended by his only his closest associates. So the good news was they got a lot out of the space even back in those days. Right it's time to now leave the king's chamber and head to the Wakefield Tower which is our next place. So we're going to go up these steps and then go across a bridge. Now the cover bridge we're going over was rebuilt in the 19th century on the site of the earlier one and this links the Edward Thomas's tower to the Wakefield Tower and this was built by his father Henry III. So the Wakefield Tower was built by Henry III as a royal lodging between 1220 and 1240 and originally sat at the river's edge. Of course the river then moved out at later times. Now Henry was able to arrive by boat and enter his rooms from private stairs leaving from a postern gate. The principal room which is the one we're looking at here was probably a private audience chamber. You've got a replica throne and a canopy and they're based on 13th century examples. The pattern on the canopy and the cushion featuring the Plantagenet lion is the symbol of the royal family and you can also see that right here above the chimney breast on the painting. Really hope you're enjoying this video and if you are give this video a thumbs up will you on YouTube. This will help get this video spread out to more people so that they can see and love London as well. Thanks. This area would have been Henry III's own private chapel in the Wakefield Tower. The screen and area are restored but it's very much like the one described in a detailed order by Henry which said and for making good the suitable screen of wooden boards between the chamber and the chapel of the new turret facing the Thames 16 pounds 3 shillings and 8 pence. Sounds like a bargain these days. And as you can see from the plaque here it said that Henry VI died here in 1471. So here's a bit of lesser known history for you. It's said that he died of melancholy after hearing that his son had been killed in battle in the War of the Roses. His supporters however claimed that he'd been stabbed to death while praying. Now since 1923 the ceremony of lizzies and roses has been held here in this particular place every year on the evening of the 21st of May, the day of Henry's death and is attended by representatives from Eton College and King's College in Cambridge. And both of these institutions were actually founded by the unfortunate king. As the royal family grew and its needs grew more the parts of the palace moved within the Tower of London and this tower became known as the royal wardrobe and all the different clothes were kept here. But from 1870 until 1967 this particular tower was used to house the crown jewels where they were displayed here for people to come and look at. Now it's time to leave the medieval palace which back in the times when Edward I and King Henry III used it was a lot bigger extending to where the White Tower is now. But we go up this turret and we're back out on the southern battlements. And this battlement gives you fantastic views over Tower Bridge and the Thames but also the inside of the Tower of London as well and across to the White Tower. Next we hit the Langthorne Tower which is our next tower along. When the tower was originally built back in the 1200s it was built as part of the Queen's lodgings gutted by a fire in 1774. What we're looking at now is a present building from the 19th century. Inside it is 13th century objects which illustrate the lifestyle of Henry and Edward's courts and we'll show you those in a couple of ticks. But Edward's son Edward II between 1307 and 1327 stayed in the east side of this castle when in residence at the tower. Eventually the whole tower was adapted into the king's chambers. 
And it's incredible to think back then when the kings moved around the country to their different stately homes, all of this sort of stuff followed suit as well. These coins are from Edward I's reign, but if you haven't seen our video yet on the Royal Mint, which is an unknown, almost a completely unknown part of the Tower of London, then I've put a link to it up in the top right hand corner for you, because we've got a whole load of coins from different reigns in there for you to see. It's incredible what's been preserved here, including these counters from the old game before Backmammon called Tableman. And I love how used those dice are, no longer square anymore. And you think, that's incredible. How about this made out of rock crystal? This would have been a chess piece used in the 1100s. Now we leave the Langthorne Tower, which is probably one of the smallest towers on the southern battlements. We go onto the battlement and our next stop is that tower right in front of us. It's our third and final tower, which is the Salt Tower. The Salt Tower originally overlooked the Thames, and in times of trouble, archers on the ground floor were able to protect it by shooting through the arrow loops. During peaceful times, the ground floor of the tower was a storehouse for Salt Petre, used for making gunpowder, and hence, that's how the Salt Tower got its name. The potential of using the Salt Tower as a prison was exploited by the Tudor monarchy, and prisoner's graffiti is carved into the soft stone walls, and you're going to see probably the most elaborate piece here by Hugh Draper. And this is the Hugh Draper astrological chart, and this was from 1561. Yes, we have graffiti from 1651. It shows the different signs of the zodiac and also the planetary influence on the hours and the minutes. But interestingly enough, Draper was actually imprisoned on charges of sorcery in 1561. During the reign of Elizabeth I of 1558 to 1603, many of the people that were actually held prisoners here were Catholic priests. And as you can see here from the various bits of graffiti, everyone seemed to bear a grudge against Elizabeth I. Or she thought they did. The room is not exactly massive, and we're going to show you around in just one second, but for a room that's not that big, the volume of prisoners that were held here was quite vast, and hence all of the graffiti sitting on the walls, which have been preserved underneath Perspex, so you can actually have a really good look at them. And here, also, much like much of the Tower of London, the places where they had people, they had big fireplaces. In this video, we've looked at the towers on the southern side of the Tower of London. So we've looked at the medieval palace, which was used by Henry III and also Edward I. We've also looked at the Lanthorn Tower, and we've also finished off in the Salt Tower, which as you can see, lots and lots of graffiti from prisoners from years gone by. So which was the bit that interested you the most? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed that, you're not going to want to miss our walk around the outskirts of the tower around the battlements, and I'll put a link to that video in the top right hand corner.